Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, things are good. I, uh, I finished day 48 of my push-up accountability challenge this morning before going out on a run. The um, the nature of the challenge is to add one more push-up to that single set every day. So that means I did a set of 48 push-ups. I do more, you know, later on in the day, but that first set is what I shoot on video, post on Twitter for accountability's sake, etc. Um, so yes, 48 push-ups this morning. Uh, when I started almost seven weeks ago, uh, it was a 25 push-ups a day challenge. It was a struggle to get to 15. And by day three, I, I thought I'd suffered a broken rib or had dislodged, you know, lung tumor or something like that. But, but I stuck with it and I adapted it after the initial 30 day challenge expired. And, uh, and here we are, I'm supposed to end it with day 50, but, um, I'm not really sure what's going to replace it. See, the neat thing about this challenge, and you can come up with any sort of version of this, um, is what I'm trying to get across here, is that every morning I try something I've never done before. It's it's a really neat way to start the day because it tells me there's this this broad horizon out there awaiting me. And again, this is a physical thing. Um you might find something else, but, you know, maybe you can give yourself some sort of challenge that also kind of regenerates you every morning. I, meanwhile, do not want to go past 50 a day because or 50 in a single set because <laughs> everything after 40 has been really tough so far. Um, so I want to come up with another feasible challenge that'll take me places I've never been before, especially, you know, because I'm stuck here at home. And that's sort of what the best poetry does, which brings us to this week's guest. Um, Henri Cole joins us from Boston this time around. Uh, he has this brand new collection of poems out called Blizzard. It's from Farrar strauss Garo, FSG. Um, longtime listeners know that I frame myself as a poetry moron. Um, I think that's because of my, my tendency for speed and volume. Um, I kind of too often race through what I'm reading. And while well, I can generally accommodate that for prose, even though it does, um, it does mean I don't retain as much from uh, a lot of the books that I sort of, you know, burn my way through for the sake of the podcast. Um, it's death for appreciating poetry. And uh, that's why I was glad to let Blizzard slow me down and, and draw me into it. Henri's primary form is the sonnet, and a lot of the poems in this one are, are the 14-line format. Um, and there are a couple of different sonnet forms, but uh, the last time I, I had to remember those was when I took a test to place out of Dumb Dumb English in my, my first semester of college. But the poems in Blizzard are... They're graceful. They are earthy. They, they made me feel like a little less of a moron about poetry. They covered sort of mundane quotidian aspects of life and, and transform them into these, these sort of grace notes of beauty. In the third section, it, it's broken out in three 14 poem sections. Uh, Henri writes about 
aspects of his his gay life in the 1980s. That's an era that a lot of past guests and, and people I know, like Samuel Delaney, Edmund White, and guys like that, lived through. And it's it's kind of interesting seeing that transformed into poetry in this book. And throughout, Henri's poems are are accessible, but they can they can lead you into a deeper sense of the real, if if that makes sense. I think he refers to himself as a, a hyper realist or super realist. Um and those those real details transformed by poetry are are just magic. So Blizzard, the collection, is wonderful, but it pairs beautifully. It gets even better when you read Henri's previous book, this this sort of poetic memoir called Orphic Paris. Orphic is O-R-P-H-I-C. It was published by New York Review Books, that one. And we talk about both of those in this conversation, and I, I recommend both books highly. But the thing I want to tell you about, and the thing I love most about this conversation, is it's this moment near the end when Henri talks about one of James Merrill's final poems, Christmas Tree. I ask a question that it takes me about five minutes to get through because I'm so uptight about it, but he tackles it beautifully. And he talks about the significance of Christmas Tree and its imagery coming at the the too soon end of, of Merrill's life. Merrill died of, of AIDS. When I was editing this this episode, I stopped at that point that we talked about it, and I took Merrill's collected poems off my shelf, and and I read Christmas Tree. And it was utterly heartbreaking. And I'd have gotten some of that feeling from reading the poem blind, but... But having Henri talk about it beforehand gave me this this framework where the poem meant so much more. And it's it's moments like this that make the podcast project so meaningful to me and, and maybe to you guys as listeners. That that aspect of of basking in someone else's learning and and reveling in their insights, whether it's about their own work or or the stuff that inspired them. But it it opens doors. Anyway, um, this episode came together because Henri and I were both at Harold Bloom's memorial service last January. We were both outsiders, which comes up during the conversation. And, well, basically, uh, one tweet led to another. I think he was the first one to tweet something from there. And I said, oh, I thought I saw you at the memorial. And that's sort of how we began our conversation. Now, as caveats go... Got to apologize, uh, Henri's audio wasn't great this time around. His internal computer mic picked up some noise. I had a tough time filtering it out. This is also one of those conversations that um, I think would have benefited more from being in person. You know, we we were just getting to know each other's rhythms speaking, and there's just something about the disembodiedness that made it just a little tough for me. Um, but I'm hoping... We get to do this in person um, in the not foreseeable future. Now, here's Henri's bio. Henri Cole was born in Fukuoka, Japan in 1956. I know I mispronounced that. He has published nine previous collections of poetry, including Touch and Pierce the Skin, as well as a memoir, Orphic Paris. And he has received many awards for his work including the Jackson Poetry Prize, the Kingsley Tufts Award, the Rome Prize, the Berlin Prize, the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, and the Award of Merit Medal in Poetry from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He teaches at Claremont McKenna College. His new collection is Blizzard Poems. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Henri Cole. How did Blizzard come together? Was there a structure in mind for it? How, how does a poetry collection become a piece for you? Well, um, for me, it's one poem at a time, uh, month after month, year after year. I don't really write project books, um, as I know many people do. Um, my poems are kind of a transcript of life as it is lived, which is, 
unchartable. Um, so that's how uh, that's how my books have come together to date. Um, you know, there, you reach a point, maybe, or I reach a point after maybe four years um, of sitting down on the floor and spreading everything out and seeing how things relate to one another. And if I need to write something that is more ambitious or something introductory or uh, poems that might serve as connectors, and it's only at that point that I, and that's really very late in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, or not game, but endeavor, let's say. Um, so this book, you know, I think I turned it in a year ago. Um, and I suppose I spent five years making the poems that it contains. What were some of the, the connections and themes you saw when you, when you laid this one out on the floor? And it's broken into three parts. Yes. Well, I suppose the first part is uh, more miscellaneous, more um, a little more miscellaneous than the others. They're poems of nature, of, of the world, of of the self. Um, they're more various. Let's say that the second part of the book is mm -hmm. uh, well. One of the functions of the lyric poem is to look inward and. One of the functions is to look outward and be more public. And, and the poems in the second section are intended as more public poems to speak to the historical moment um, or moments in which we're living. And then the third part, uh, I suppose, is more autobiographical. Well, all the poems are autobiographical, really. I write from memory and, and biography. But um, in this section, uh, I suppose I speak more to, uh, uh, first off, a time in my life in the 80s, the 1980s, when I lived in New York City. And then uh, maybe they deal a little more with questions of identity and um, sexuality and selfhood. Does that make sense to you as a reader? Uh it does. And I was glad that the first section came off as miscellany or variety because I was struggling to figure out exactly what to, to characterize it, where parts two and three did cohere, you know, as, as those specific themes you brought up. That question of identity, and I'm asking this as a, a straight guy, um, gay poet or poet who's a, a gay man? I would say just poet. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say poem. I know. <laughs> Is that um I don't know. labels and tags and all that stuff. It's it's yeah, I, I just know how it um, uh, my language yeah. is your language. Um yeah. you know, I think if you and I look at the moon, um we see the moon. When is a poem done? Um, that's a hard question. Uh, I, I ask it as somebody who can never start anything because I'm afraid I'll never be able to finish anything. So, yes, uh, I figured <laughs> you may be able to, to help. <laughs> so much of writing is a is I don't know a kind of intuitive sense of rightness about a line, about a stanza and about closure of a poem. So um, the endings of my poems are sort of the hardest for me. And I often write a poem that is that feels, oh, I don't know, kind of two-dimensional, let's say. And I feel it needs this third dimension, uh, wanting the poem to arrive at a not just a sense of rightness in terms of the the sound, um, but also in terms of arriving at some fresh idea, um, some knowledge that uh, the poem doesn't expect to arrive at at the beginning. That kind of psychological journey is really important to me. Um, 
and that's not something you can predict or chart at the start. Mm -hmm. It's my sense. Uh, and this will sound like a knucklehead question, but I mean, are these, do, do you write ultimately sequentially? Are, are there times that you have the ending in mind and kind of, I know everything gets edited afterwards, but is there a degree that, you know, I've got this phenomenal finish and, you know, I'll figure out the, the poem that leads to it. Um, very rarely do I have the ending. Um, mm. A friend of mine is a prose writer tells me, a story writer, novelist, tells me she always knows the ending. And um, that is sort of what I write to word without knowing it. Um, yeah. I want the ending to really be, a, in part, a discovery of the act of writing. Um, it's a... Okay, you're you have the understanding that I'm a poetry knucklehead in in some respects. So uh, thank you for bearing with me <laughs> with some of the more <laughs> technical questions along those lines. But but how have you how have you changed as a poet over the decades? I've listened to a lot of your interviews. You're not a knucklehead. I know that. So uh, <laughs> you don't need to de deprecate yourself. I, uh, my line is either that or I'm some schlub from New Jersey. But yeah. I know. <laughs> I've heard both of those on your, your yeah. so uh, that that's disarming. <laughs> but I know you're very clever. So um, I uh, I don't be too wary. Is all I ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, how did you change as a poet? Or I mean, are there things you look back at in your earlier work and either marvel or are filled with shame and embarrassment? Uh, okay, how how have you changed? I guess we'll Absolutely. we'll just leave it there. Well, sometimes I see someone doing something mm -hmm. and I want to do, try that too. Like as I'm talking, I'm looking down. I live on the fifth floor and I'm looking down at a park and I'm, a man is standing on his hands and throwing his legs back against the wall and doing sort of, I don't know, like crunches on his hands. And I was thinking, wouldn't that be great to be able to do that um, and <laughs> convert that into language? You know, so often my reading really inspires me. I'll see an example of someone doing something. It may not be from this century even, um, more likely not. <clears throat> and I'll want to try and update it and try something different. I think when I was a young man, um, I wrote poems that were that used nature as a mask for private matters. Um, uh, and as I, as I, I don't know, as the closet sort of disintegrated, I think I became more, um, you know, more directly autobiographical. Um, though the facts of the poems are in a way the least interesting thing to me. Um, I want the language in them to be uh, kind of more interesting than the facts, the autobiographical facts. So I have to, as time passes, think of ways to, you know, try something different and mutate or metamorphose or... Uh, change, uh, refresh. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and this, that's all, that process is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of an invisible process as it's happening. Um, there are failures along the way. Um, Do you recognize certain poems or, or times as, as sort of milestones or turning points for you? Sure. Um, I lived in Japan one year when I was 45, mm -hmm. and um, that was a, a kind of deep transformational year. Um, um, I suppose these last years have been transformational for me as well uh, for personal <laughs> reasons, uh, just aging and and events of one's life. When I was 45, I was in Japan, and I, 
I just kind of figured out that I wanted a lot of less less stuff in my poems. I wanted them to be more direct, more uh, more feeling, more um, interesting language, but uh, more matter of fact sounding, yet psychologically complex. And this came from reading probably from reading the Japanese novelist Kawabata, whom I, whom I adore. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the journey of my life has sort of been a bit towards, my journey of my life as a writer has been towards more pellucidness or more transparency. But maybe that's the journey of everybody's life. That's the process of aging. You know, I was the more. That's what I was wondering. When, when you say it's your, your journey as a poet, is that synonymous with your journey as you? Maybe. I, is there a difference, I, I guess? Probably only a, a critic or a shrink could make that determination. <laughs> but I, <laughs> Nobody yeah. listens to them. So. <laughs> I feel more direct in my being, but, um, you know, that is a privilege of age, perhaps. But, uh, you know, I, I think because I'm about to turn 65, I grew up reading certain poets that maybe are not read so widely now. And so I do have a sense of a poem as being uh, uh not just spoken, sounding like spoken, uh, the spoken language. I think I have a sense of it being a little higher than that, a little more made. Um, you know, if you think of it like a volume knob on a stereo, you know, I would, I would put the volume on the language up to three, four, five, six, um, you know, rather than at one or two. I think younger people behind behind me maybe have a different sense of language and that's a sense of uh of uh you know the legacy the legacy of reading and and the canon canonizing it in poem. terms of oh i'm sorry i thought you meant you know the the younger poets think more in terms of of the spoken word and and a performative aspect of the poem um, I wasn't actually thinking of that. I was thinking more of social media and texting and uh, blogging and that kind of uh, yeah. that kind of language sort of finding its way into poetry today. So poetry does sound very much like uh, many poems sound very much alike. Um, uh, they may be distinct by sensibility of the artist, but they all have this kind of vernacular of social media, maybe. Um, that's not a bad thing. That's just a characterization. Um, yeah. But it, it sounds like you're saying it's poetry as communication, as opposed to some higher, uh, as, as almost simply communication. Um, but again, maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding or misreading. Um, I wouldn't say that. I think of maybe newspapers more as communication. Um, um, well, when you say newspapers, you're dating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I do read the paper still, but the uh, I mean, I'm thinking this this vernacular may still have metaphors and similes, and you know, it may still be rich, but in a in a kind of social media way, you know. I mean, it, um, yeah. I mean, I, it's different, you know. I mean, I, it's not made with full sentences usually, full complex compound sentences. And I, you know, I'm still drawn, very drawn to all that. Um, and uh, I date myself with that. And of course, one of the saddest things in the life of a poet is to see one's language go out of, out of mode or fashion or become dated. Um, so. You, you do have that question in Orphic Paris about uh, what is a poet later on in life, quoting that, that uh, Byron poet at, at 40 uh, uh, line. And I guess as you're approaching 65, what is a poet later on in life? Well, I still feel so young in my spirit. Um, so I feel in the sense I'm uh, 
my body is older, but my mind is younger. I feel in a way I'm going backwards in terms of of the youth of my spirit. Um, so maybe that's that's what an aging poet is, that paradox of decrepitude and vibrant, bud-like beauty. Um, I don't know. I'll know more in 15 years, maybe. <laughs> we can hope. Now, I guess along those lines, what is teaching teach you yeah you 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 teach poetry again it obviously puts you in tune with what younger students slash poets are engaged in but what do you learn from that well um in my particular case i'm a single man i don't have children i don't have a spouse so i think my students sort of keep me human to an extent um um yeah. You know, they just keep me in touch with it used to be that I was about the age of their parents. And now it's like I'm their great uncle or something. I don't know. But um, <laughs> I'm older than their parents now. So um, but I I I really enjoy the time I have with my students. And, you know, I have a freedom in my relationship with them uh, that they're that, let's say, I can help them in ways that their parents can't, if you will, because because of my role as a professor. Um, and that's quite endearing to me. Um, so it's, I guess the energy goes both ways is what I, I want to say. Um, it's not all going out towards them. I, I get an awful lot from it. And I really miss actually now these days when the term is beginning and I'm wondering, you know, how it will be with the remote teaching. But, um, did you have to do that last semester or were you, uh, we had six or seven weeks together. So, and I had, I was teaching a class, I was teaching an advanced class and, uh, a third of them I'd had the first semester. So, you know, we, I had a relationship with a lot of the kids already when we went virtu virtual. So it went very well. I have to say, I felt it adapted altogether, you know, with e great ease. Um, but uh, starting cold with all new faces is going to be a different experience. Um, and I'm teaching introductory students. And, um, you know, I, I am a little wary but we'll see. I'll, I plan to give it my best. And um, in a way, there's a, I don't know, in a way, it's sort of like driving with someone in the night on this virtual business, I find. And you, you're able to say things and be more direct in a way, I find, than the formality of the classroom. So maybe, maybe in fact, it'll be better in some ways. Um, that's an interesting perspective. I, I just, most everybody I know is, every teacher I've spoken to has been nervous going into a new class like you were, uh, like you were talking about, but nobody brings up that sort of advantage. Um, I do feel there are advantages, but I mean, there's obviously a, a real loneliness to it as well. Um, um, you know, when I leave class, I'm not going to get on my bike and ride home past my students walking home in the night and you know i mean it's just leave <laughs> leave zoom room yeah. leave zoom room you know, <laughs> yeah leave, press the red button and you're leave done. meeting <laughs> i will just leave the meeting so i think i'm going to have longer you know longer office hours i'll just have the zoom room open for several hours and see who i i'm curious you know i hope the students will drop in and just talk if they if yeah i wonder if that would be easier for them than the effort of going to the building you know knocking on the door etc yeah i just don't know yeah well how i mean it's it's been a while how have students changed over the the years as far as you can tell either knowledge of poetry or or subject well any, how have they changed Oh, I think they're wiser. I think they're more mature. They're more 
you know, more adapted. They grow up with much more harshness from an early, you know, they're, they're so much is made of their needing shelter and protection, but it seems to me they're, they're much, uh, much more sophisticated and uh, have experienced many more things than I have and are better writers than I was. Um, so I am always stunned, uh, stunned by the talent and also by the kindness of them, of them, I have to say, in a kind of harsh time that they're, they make me look forward to the future. Do you ever imagine what you'd be like transposed into to this era if you were a kid today? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't think I ever do. I think, you know, I made the decision to be a poet when, I mean, I went, I went to a little liberal arts college in Virginia and took my first writing class there and, you know, applied to graduate school kind of innocently with the, the desire to continue making poems. I, I, you know, I suppose my parents might have been happier if I'd gone to work for the government or uh, worked at a bank or sold real estate or something. But I think it was a more innocent time in a way. Um, now I think the pressure of mm -hmm. the pressure of uh, well, I don't know what the students are experiencing right now. This is an unbelievable year to graduate, but um, um, sure, yeah. I the think career that, expectations would have. Uh, yeah, yeah there's, everything is kind of squashed it seems to me but um it's such an it seems to me much more an act of bravery to pursue uh poet poetry um it really is going against uh everything commercial in terms of uh capitalism <laughs> so um uh i don't know that i'd be different i i don't know maybe it's just the same maybe all maybe they experience the same uh, fear, anxiety, excitement that I experienced. Um, there are many more writing programs than when I was a young man. Um, I expect that it's much harder to get in. I went to Columbia, and I expect it much harder to get into Columbia than when I was 23 or 4 or 5. Um, hmm. I really grew up, though, in, in the writing program. Yes, I was going to ask how important that was for you in terms of shaping who you became as a poet. Well, it was very important. I think I was much more of a nascent talent than most. Um, uh, I was very green. Um, and, you know, I had amazing teachers. Um, I had Derek Walcott, Joseph Brodsky, Richard Howard. Um, I mean, an astonishing list of probably 10 different poets. Um, and I was so unformed. But I, I, what it did for me is it exposed me to many um, styles, many sensibilities, many aesthetics. And in the years after I graduated, that is the years of my late 20s and early 30s, you know, I, those were synthesizing years of making choices about the kind of poet I wanted to be and the kind of poem I wanted to write. And um, so I, I'm not sure I wrote anything of interest when I was a student, but I absorbed a great deal uh, that I, mm -hmm. that I, I still use. You know, I, I became a close reader um, really as a graduate student. And that's a big part of writing. So, yeah. At what point did you um, experience a, a, a sense of belonging with poets of, of that? Well, have you ever felt that, that, that sense of belonging with poets of that caliber? You know, that sense of being in that, that, that peerage in a sense that you, you fit in, you, you, you know, you belong. Oh, 
I don't know that I would use the word belonging. I wonder what is the right word, though. Um, as I age, the thing that I makes me I hate to use fraternity because I don't get a... <laughs> oh, that's a good word. Yeah, like a... Or sorority. Um, as I age, the thing that is that is saddest to me is is having fewer and fewer poets to look up to because so many so many have died in the last five to eight years. There are really just two or three to whom I I I hold in in you know when when I was in my forties there were you know. 15, 20 of them. So that's the saddest part for me. Is So then I think you begin to look for younger people to have a conversation with. Uh, or maybe that's just my nature. I was always drawn to older people. I guess I had an old soul mm -hmm. as a young man. And... Um, and uh, that gets harder as you get older. Um, even the poets, many poets of my own generation have died, you know, prematurely. And that's a real sadness. Um, I mean, you and I, we didn't meet, but we, uh, at least I saw you at, at Harold Bloom's memorial in, in January, where I was risking my life in that ridiculous snowstorm to get back to New Jersey afterwards. Um that sets, and I know Bloom wasn't a poet, but, you know, somebody who um, certainly gave you high praise as a poet. And I wasn't sure, again, that sense of um, not making it, but, but you know, belonging in that, that literary fraternity or sorority, that sense that, you know, the work you were making was, was being um, observed critically. It and did well. make a difference. Yes, it did make a difference. I mean, it made it. I mean, I'm a person that had a series of, you know, contract jobs until I was in my 50s. So, um, you know, Harold Bloom wrote to me when I was in my late 30s, and I wasn't his student, um, but uh, he read my poems and he sent me a fan letter. And, you know, he kind of stayed by my side for 20 some years, um, almost 30 years. Um, and, and, you know, wrote recommendations for Guggenheims I didn't receive and jobs I didn't get and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it, it was astonishing to me. It's embarrassing for me to think about, um, uh, but he never, you know, he never, um, he never lost faith in my talent. And, you know, yes, that was a kind of foundation to stand on through some lean years. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll always be grateful to him. I have here on we my book. joke that the recommendations were actually the things that were black marks against you, but I'm, I'm kidding. Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sure my story is not so different than many other poets of my generation, but, um, um, you know, I sort of backed into academia. I had a first job in arts administration and then I began to teach and, um, was a, you know, it was in my 30s when I began to teach. It's not like I got a PhD and was an assistant professor and worked my way up, as as is the customary, and as, it's no easier to do it that way. But um, I hope there are readers around like Harold Bloom still. You know, I mean, I hope there are uh, people of that eminence and sensitivity and intelligence that are writing strangers and encouraging them to keep going. Um, you know, uh, that's an enormous power to have. At the memorial, I was gratified by the number of people who were significantly younger than me. Not that I spoke to any of them. I only talked to people older than myself, as, as you were talking about with your own uh, uh, old soul fixation. Um, but yeah, it was good to see people who were who at least look like they're in their twenties and thirties who wanted yes. to be there and, and wanted to, to pay their respects. 
oh, I think he had many students there. I, re I felt very much like it was a Yale crowd. Um, and I, I realized that I was not, I felt very much that, I realized that my friendship with uh, Harold Bloom had nothing to do with Yale, really, by, by going to his funeral, that it was really, um, really from postcards and I have felt... There were a number of in-jokes and Yale-specific references during that memorial that I felt the same way. You know, I thought this is kind of, you know, very, very Yale specific, you know, comments and, and references going on. But, I know. still have his voice on my phone machine. Just just being nice. Yeah. You know, um, I hope I never have to lose. Yeah. What's your your writing practice like? Is there a, a routine you engage in? at all or times you set aside specifically uh, what what's writing practice for you well um in the last weeks and months in confinement um i have been trying to write some prose um mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the poems that i've written in the last years i suppose that are in blizzard i wrote in Fr i wrote in france i gone to France quite a bit in the last, my mother was a French woman. And since my mother died, uh, I've gone to France, France three or four times a year. And that's the place where I've most been able to sort of disconnect and, and make poems. But in the last weeks and months here, I've been trying to start a little prose project. And, and I suppose a daily practice is the way that I most productive um, and writing at a higher level. It's hard to write at a high level when you're just kind of dipping your toe in very irregularly. Mm -hmm. For me, for me, I find that. Um, so I'm hoping to keep it going with, with the remote teaching, um, but we'll see. Do you miss Paris most of uh, is losing Paris the toughest part of of the lockdown and quarantine for you? Well, I sort of miss this the desert of Southern California and the outdoor swimming pools. <laughs> I mean, I love that landscape there at the <laughs> I love that landscape there at the base of the mountains on the edge of the desert. Um, it's spectacularly beautiful and and uh, I sure hope I can go in January. I hope we won't be remote. I hope there'll be a vaccine. Um, I hope, uh, I hope that happens for my students. Based on too. my day job. Uh, I think we're going to be, we're going to be waiting a little while longer for that, but oh. we'll, we'll see. You know. What is your day job? I'm a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> I see. Oh, <laughs> it, but... It's more complicated than it sounds. I represent, the companies that make drugs for drug companies, like the way your printer makes the book for your publisher. Uh huh. So, I see. So my guys aren't the bad guys. They just they just make the physical thing for them. So they're the guys who are going to have to put the vaccines to actually manufacture them and put them in vials and and all that stuff. But they're not going to be the guys who are developing it or deciding on pricing or anything weird. But but in that role, I I um. I hear some things about progress, so sure. uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed, but I think we'll be waiting a little, little longer um, as these uh -huh. things go. But, well, too many but, people you know, have died. keep faith, keep hope, you know. Yes, I do keep yeah. faith. I do keep hope. Did you find quarantine to be particularly difficult? Yeah, outside of not being able to, to travel and not being able to go back, but just the day-to-day the -day aspect of it? Was it something um, you were able to acclimate to? It's become less difficult. It's become less intense. I mean, I'm still very mm -hmm. cautious. I have a pod. I'm part of a pod of just two people, really, maybe three. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I see my two or three people in my pod, but I don't, you know, I don't see any others. I still wear, I still wear gloves when I go out but I, everyone tells me not to do that. Um, and um, 
I mean, there are aspects of the riding life that suit this kind of uh, weird isolation. Um, thank goodness for the telephone and for email. Um, but, you know, I miss hugging my friends at the end of a dinner. A dinner, You know, I miss. Um, but I'm grateful for the two or three people I've been in touch with. Really, I just have three people now that I... I'm able to see for lunch or dinner, maybe once a week. Um, um, I'm glad that less people are dying in Boston. You know, I mean, it's. Uh, yeah. But uh, the, all around the Northeast, we look back at April and May, and it was just the the, the numbers we were seeing back then are just impossible to imagine. Um, what it was like for us, you know, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts. Yeah. But yeah. I feel lucky that I, you know, I have an apartment. I live alone. I can basically control my environment. I was, I'm a very lucky person in that regard. I do think about those that don't have that privilege, you know, so I'm. Yeah, that, that that my standard line is if if my biggest inconvenience is that I have to do these podcasts this way instead of in person, I'm I don't have much to complain about. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm actually getting by okay. So yeah, I still have a job. You know? Well, you, you mentioned working on this prose project. Are you able? Or have you thought about? Have any poems started to come into existence? Um, you know, during this this span. I have written just one poem um, in this time mm -hmm. of confinement. It's an upbeat poem. I wanted to write a kind of upbeat. Uh, it's sort of about, it's just sort of full of the sensoria that I observe outside my windows, uh, you know, which was spring coming into being and the birds on the telephone wires and uh, the sounds at night. It's just, it's a poem of confinement, I suppose, but it's an upbeat poem. Um, um, but I do have new poems. As I say, I turned in my book over a year ago, and I mean, the manuscript of Blizzard. So I do have new poems that I've started towards a new manuscript, but I haven't published any of them. I haven't, I haven't, Mm -hmm. sort of moved into that phase yet of uh, the next thing. Um, I guess that's my question again as to when a, a poem is actually done, but, but yeah. When a poem is actually done? Yeah, we, we, we mentioned at the beginning when I yeah. asked, when do you know a poem's finished? And I guess when you're sending it out for publication would, would make sense. Oh, even then, I suppose it's not necessarily done. You get ideas that even after it's published sometimes to change things. Sometimes events happen that change. I was just thinking of the last line that I changed in Blizzard um, was really, you know, very late in the game. And that was just because of events in life. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to correct something. But um, I heard someone once be asked that question, how do you know when a poem is done? And she said, by its smell, and I thought that was very clever. <laughs> but I'm sorry, my my answer isn't as clever. Thievery is just fine if you can pick up somebody. You know, as a poet, you know you're always picking up uh, pieces of what came before. So, uh, along those lines, can you? Well, uh, you seem from interviews I've read and and from Orphic Paris to occasionally engage in like literary pilgrimage or at least visiting the graves of of writers like elizabeth bishop and, and susan sontag is that a, a a thing for you at all the the sense of either visiting their their resting place or the the places where they where writers lived and worked very much so you know very much so i yeah. i find very moving um the act of honoring those whose shoulders I stand upon, and I never knew Elizabeth Bishop. I I feel influenced by her. Um, there are many poets of my generation who were her students, 
but um, I went to her grave a couple a couple weeks ago. Actually, I drove out to Worcester. It was my first uh, little car trip uh, since early March, yeah. and um, I went with a friend, and we made a little. We brought sandwiches and made a little picnic there at her grave, and uh, I'm so glad I did that. It was like I don't know. It was like a, an awakening of some sort for me. Um, I've been trying to write about Bishop in this prose I've been working on um, as a person, though I though I wasn't her student, never met her, never heard her read. Um, I feel connected to her through my teachers or through my friends or through um, a number of other sources. So uh, what I've been writing is about Bishop, but it also has a autobiographical, a memoir component. And uh, I don't actually know quite what I'm doing, but uh, it has the same collage style that the Paris book had. Um, and going to visit a grave was, was a kind of catalyst in the process. But yes, I'm eager to go down to Stonington, Connecticut and visit James Merrill's grave. That's my next little field trip in the fall. I plan to do that. Um, and I've been writing a little bit about their their friendship. Yeah, I was thinking of, well, I, I believe Blizzard starts out with a Merrill epigram. I always screw up epigram and epigraph. Uh, epigraph. Uh, you've got the bit from the, the yeah. book of a fr epigraph. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Again, language should be exact, but um, you know, seeing you in that that continuum, you know, for me, you know, when I mentioned being a poetry imbecile, it's really in a sense just because a chunk of my education came only a few years ago from reading Langdon Hammer's giant biography of Merrill and sort of seeing threads and and you know connections from that into a lot of contemporary poets as well as who came before so um sure. getting the merrill and bishop stories and everything else and yeah getting out to stonington to record with sandy mcclatchy a couple of years ago was was i watched big that or i listened to that um, I, I know that was important to you so i went yeah. and listened to that yeah it's a was an interesting interview um Merrill was about 15 years younger than Bishop. And so there was a generational, um, one generation difference. But, you know, they they both really liked each other and had a real affection between them. And I find, I find their friendship quite poignant and uplifting. Um, Do you have more friends in the arts or outside the arts? Um, I suppose in the arts, you know, I mean, I have just one or two, one or two poetry friends in the area here. And, um, I suppose, I mean, I didn't grow up in the arts. My family isn't in the arts. Um, I, you know, my college is not a arts college. Um. Uh, I'm not sure that matters, though, to me so much. Um, I think what matters maybe is something deeper. Um, yeah. I mean, deeper in us and our beings. Um, That's just, you know, it, it wasn't a psychiatrist question or anything, but I just wonder, you know, about our circles of friends and how many of them are, are in the same space we are, at least you know, in terms of career, vocation, art, however we want to frame it. Yeah. And then what it means to us to look outside of that. Probably some of my dearest friends are people I've met in, you know, in, in writers' colonies or artists' colonies or residency programs abroad or, uh, you know, they're people I might not have met otherwise or they're friends of friends, you know, friends of friends that, uh, Trust me, it, it's like my it's like my podcast social network where there's people I've been introduced to by other guests and who kind of proliferate like that. It's uh, you know it's interesting seeing what those connections are like and how you can trace them back to to certain people. But in that respect, you, you mentioned Merrill and, and other poets as as 
influences um, throughout your development. Do you see yourself or see yourself get cited as an influence on, on younger poets? Oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody I wants to that, cop to that, but yeah, know. no, I mean, sometimes I do see gestures, you know, gestures that I think of as signature, you know, in younger writers, uh, uh, but you know, that may be a form of vanity to, to feel that way. Um, um, maybe if that's true, it's more present in young gay writers. Um, maybe, um, you know, there are four or five gay poets of my generation that I think have been influential on, I mean, there were only four or five that I, I was so aware of when I was coming of age, but now there's, you know, 10 times that many, um, uh, 50 times that many, uh, you know, first book authors or manuscripts waiting for publishers. There's just a whole different culture. Um, um, so I suppose in some way, maybe we haven't, that, you know, if we are people, I mean, we are influenced by the people we read, you know, we're all as readers, we're all kind of feeding, you know, in a way. Um, so it would be natural that young people would be influenced by me or D.A. Powell or Mark Doty or Carl Phillips or, um, you know, these are other gay men who, you know, whom I admire that are of my generation. I mean, there are others too. I shudder to ask this because you're probably going to say that's an insanely stupid question, Gil, but... Well, you mentioned um, when you were closeted using nature imagery as a sort of um, you know, uh, symbolic of, of, you know, who you were when you weren't out as a gay man. Is there any respect that being closeted, um, God, uh, I'm going to kick myself for asking this, stimulated your imagination and language that need to create covers and symbols? That is, is there, was there anything beneficial to the language and poetry that came from the tragedy of being closeted? I think there definitely is. I mean, that's a paradox. I mean, take a poet like Hart Oh, thank God. Crane. I thought you were going to shout at me. Okay. <laughs> no, take a po poet yeah. like uh, Hart Crane, just to choose one. There's no question about the fact that the complexity of the surfaces of his poem is a is is a result of um, uh, speaking to a, some kind of unsanctioned desire being repressed in those poems. Mm -hmm. uh, Merrill himself admits this in his memoir that the the difficult surface of his early poems um, is attributed in part to his coming of age, you know, as a as a gay man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the most important challenges as a poet is to try and think of symbols, emblems, to speak about private experience. I mean, I don't think we all want to write everything in the most transparent, accessible way. Accessible, that word which is so praised and yet so toxic at the same time. I mean, to think of a way to write about private experience in an emblematic way, in an original way, it seems to me the thing to make a poem, one of the things that can make a poem great. I think uh, right away of James Merrill's Christmas tree poem that he wrote at the end of his life, you know, when he was HIV positive and probably knew he was going to die and didn't want to write about his circumstances in any overt way. So instead, what he writes about is the, the life of a tree being brought down from the mountains and um, being brought into a house for a short time and being adorned and treasured and um, surrounded by gifts, while behind the tree there was this ivy keeping the tree alive. And then within a matter of weeks, the tree is taken out and plowed back into the earth 
put on the street and abandoned and piled back into the earth. I mean, I can't think of a more extraordinary, original, brave image for uh, this feeling of being alive and dying simultaneously. Uh, I mean, that is a sign to me of his greatness as a, as a poet. And that's just one example. Hmm. Do you consider him the the poet of the 20th century, or for America, at least? Oh, I can't judge that. Which is a way of asking, who's your favorite poet? See, okay. <laughs> I can't judge that. No, I, I really can't judge that. I certainly think Bishop mm. uh, Bishop and Lowell were poets of the last, you know, last century. I don't know. Um, Merrill was a great poet. There's no question about that. But, you know, there were probably six or ten uh, in, in his generation worth yeah. real consideration. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, of Louise Gluck and Frank Bedard. Um, they're across the river um, in Cambridge, but they're two of my favorite living poets. Um, certainly there are others. You talk about translation and reading poetry and translation. In Orphic Paris, you've got a, a a piece about trying to translate archaic torso of Apollo or multiple translations of it and how um, ambivalent or ambiguous they are. Is it something you do you regret not having another language? Do you, you know, wish there was poetry you could read in the original? Oh, I do. I do. But nevertheless, I feel that um, my poems are inflected by my reading of other translations from other languages. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same way that American poetry was kind of cross fertilized by the Spanish language poetry in the 60s and 70s. Um, I, I feel that I have benefited from reading, you know, great translations of Zimborska or, or from the Polish language or, you know, from, or multiple other poets in, in, you know, the last 25 years. Um, that's, uh, that's a gift, you know, in, uh, in a writer's life, it seems to me. Um, you know, I read a lot of, around in, in French literature, um, uh, but in English. Um, but I, I do have a relationship with a French translator, um, and that relationship, that friendship, has uh, also kind of cross-fertilized me, if you will, because she's brought a lot, you know, brought a lot of, cult, you know, cultural um, distinctions in, in her tradition, uh, you know, she's just made me aware of things that I might not have uh, been aware of in, in my little trough here in the mm. south end of Boston. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess, and I'm sure it's something that's come up in interviews before, but tell me about your love of this. Well, not love of your your devotion to the sonnet and, and the 14 line form. Um, I think. Um, I had written sonnets in earlier books, maybe formal sonnets in my first books. But in in the year I lived in Japan, um, and I was trying to think of some kind of reset to my work, you know, I was reading all this Japanese poetry, which was in tankas and haiku forms. And I just, you know, I asked myself, what what is the shortest lyric form that my language, the English language, has a... A tradition in and could I bring qualities of these Japanese literature um, or Japanese poems into the sonnet you know bolder statement uh, simile and uh, metaphor as emblems for private feeling um, some social concern or preoccupation and that's sort of how it began and um, I do feel that the sonnet form you know I mean it is kind of a perfect lyric form because in the course of a poem, you have a chance basically for a very 
deep inhale and and uh, some utterance to be made and some uh, images to be uh, formulated and then uh, an opportunity for closure. All of that can be done in uh, 13, 14 lines. Um, and uh, um, so I just have stayed with that in a way. Um, I've tried to tweak it in all sorts of different ways, but that's where it began. Um, certainly reading sonnets also, um, you know, also influenced me. And organizing Blizzard in sets of 14 poems? Yes, it's sort of... The relatively coincidental or, or the macro sonnet that it, it forms? Yeah, it's not coincidental. Um, that would be... <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of marvelous if it was, but <laughs> no, it's a total, total act of control and calculation. Um, but, you know, we live in a time of prolixity, I feel, you know, the, the net encourages prolixity in, in poetry. I think the scroll button sort of dominates uh, so much of what we read, scroll, 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 skim, skim, skim. And I don't want to write poems that you have any desire to skim through. You know, I want I want them to be concentrated, uh, lean, muscular, um, uh, artifacts of language. Um, you know, I want I, I want them also to have deep feeling, and I want them to speak to real things. But um, I don't want them to be kind of flabby with language. Um, and the sonnet sort of encourages that position, doesn't it? Are you able to read poetry on screen? Or are you primarily, or do you prefer, you know, reading it on a on a page? Um, I can read it on my computer. I don't read electronic books. I haven't yet. I don't like reading mm -hmm. on my telephone that way. But I mean, I can, yeah. uh, I don't. You know, when I get asked to write a citation for a book or something like that, I always ask for manuscripts. When I judge any competition, I always ask for manuscripts. I don't do any of that online. I just, I just don't trust my judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like to sort of lie in bed. <laughs> you know, and be, you know, have manuscripts piled <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of old-fashioned in that sense. Yeah. I like how. I like taking them in the car. You know, I mean, I like to take, I mean, I just like reading in all sorts of circumstances, the, the electronic connection. I don't want to be always connected in that way. Um, um, yeah, so, I'm with you. But I also respect the page, you know, the page as a, as a formal shape, uh, as a controlling dimension in a lyric poem. And, I think unless you have a manuscript that gets lost. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, in these, in these poems in Blizzard, it's interesting how, I don't know, how neat it is in a way in terms of the song. I suppose the book has been designed to the sonnet form, um, but I would hate for that to be lost in, a, in, in some electronic medium. Um, I would hate for the lines to be spliced because they couldn't fit on a television screen, you know, or something. All of that is just would be <laughs> yeah, the, like the end of the violation. screen, and then it's a yeah, and then you have a, a foot, you yeah. know. I mean, that's that to me is a real violation of of aesthetics. Um, perhaps, Maybe that but, gets back to the what you were saying about younger younger poets writing as though they're texting because they they want to keep you know, the, 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 the line short so that they can fit on a screen. <laughs> I suppose that's possible. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't speak to that. I don't know that that's true. Um, yeah. Um, and if that were true, it wouldn't necessarily be bad, but, um, um, yeah. that's not how I write. Um, I was going to say not your mode. And do you write longhand or do you, are you, do you compose into a computer? No, I write longhand. I write longhand. 
I like to print things out continually, but in France, I'm not able to do that. Um, my friend Claire always gets mad at me when I want to print out another version of a poem. So I try to control <laughs> control my my <laughs> fastidiousness in that respect. But um, um, I do write with a pen and pencil and pen or pencil and a pad of paper. And then when I have 13 to 20 lines, I type them up and, you know, uh, uh, prose I've been writing, though, um, on the computer, uh, but then printing it out once mm -hmm. I have a couple of pages and then write, rewriting from, you know, correcting with hand. Um, I don't find prose any more easy than poetry. I, I find it more difficult in a way because there are more words. Um, um, I feel like I'm not writing prose the way I'm supposed to be writing it. I sort of write it the way I write poetry. Um, well, that that Orphic Paris has a, I'm probably misusing the term, but a lyric quality to it, or at least a sort of dreaminess compared to a straightforward, you know, uh, reportage or something about about one's time in Paris. Yeah, uh, it, which I it, appreciated that that sense of you know poetry being fused into a, a prose, prose form. That's right. That was my intention was to apply a kind of lyric format, which is to bring together disparate things and 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 not to be linear. Being linear is the thing that bores me quicker than anything. I don't want to be linear in poetry or prose. Um, um, yeah, I I think I benefited from having finished a reread of uh, Sebald's Rings of Saturn right before uh, starting this one because, in a sense, that's got a linearity to it, but it really is this sort of discursive yes. exploration of of you know ostensibly this walking tour in Eastern England. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had Sebald in mind when I was writing the prose and. And the way that the mind, one, one idea links to the next and to the next, it, it was really in that sense more than in the juxtaposition of image, images. We use images in very different ways. But um, mm -hmm. I once met him in Germany. Oh, yeah? How, what was it like? He was a very nice man. I was seated across from him at a lunch table and, and kind of adored him. He was just so sweet. Uh, he was very <laughs> empathetic and... Um, he was a listener and, um, and I liked him a lot. Um, he's a great writer. I love his books. Yeah. He's one whose loss, I, I, I only discovered him long after his death, but you know, that's one that I thought, oh man, if he had lived another 20, 30 years, you know, try to imagine where his, his work was going to go from there. <sighs> But yeah, I would get back to death as a great subject to leave off on. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Gil, you know, have we have we said anything interesting? I think we have, but I had two questions left for you. Um, one is, can you tell me about horses in your life? They seem to crop up in the poems a bunch, not just in Blizzard. And I don't know oh. if horses meant something as you were growing up, if they came to mean something later on, what role they play in... in your personal well, I, mythos. First, I first rode, rode a horse when I was a little boy. Um, I remember it very faintly. Um, I think we were just riding to the 7-Eleven, actually. Uh, but then, as an adult, uh, ju just being around horses in Saratoga Springs, New York, um, I spent a lot of time there. Were you for Yaddo? Yes, Yaddo, and I teach in Saratoga Springs as well in the summertime. Um, for the last 15 years, I've taught there. So um, oh. horses are a big part of the culture there. And then I also have a friend uh, who has a barn full of horses in upstate New York. And the time I've spent with her, I guess I've learned a lot about them. I hear a lot about them. Sometimes she says things I put into poems. And the real last question comes in the last page of Orphic Paris, where you mentioned that you love the red clay tennis courts at Roland Garros, where you watch your favorite player, powerful and restrained, past his prime, yet elegant, like a god in his twilight. 
Who was your favorite tennis player? <laughs> you know who that is. Um, it was Roger Federer who was playing that that game. <laughs> I assumed it was Federer, but you know, I just because the book itself, a sense of time isn't there. I thought it's possible he's referring to someone from the eighties or nineties. But you know, no, no, for no, me, no. Yeah. I was with my yeah. friend. I was with a you know ninety-year-old friend when we were doing that, and we were both very excited mm -hmm. uh, to see him play. It's the only time I've ever been there. I can't remember now how I got tickets. I think a former student gave me those tickets. Um, and that's who, that's who is being, uh, that's in the long catalog at the end of the poem. I've forgotten that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's the third to last one on the, and on the final page. And I thought if he's anything like me, it's Federer, but maybe this is going to say something very different about the, the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm glad you're on the same page as me. With no, that. that's how it, to me, he looks even better now than he did then. He's even sharper and, and uh, skillful. I mean, it's just yeah. uh, more skillful. It's astonishing to me. Well, you also, if you see him in France, you're seeing him on clay, which yes. is his, his least favorite surface. So, I see. you know, now we can nerd, we can nerd out over, over, tennis but um actually the other super last question is another line from orphic paris that a poem is organized violence and those are your words at least that definition hold up or is that a a yes, fleeting or ambiguous I, way of, of describing what you do i think it still does hold up i think it was a teacher that said that to me originally long ago when i was in my 20s but um I do feel that way. I mean, I want the poem, I don't want the poem to be bric-a-brac, baroque, you know, ornament of language. I want the the violence is in the feeling very often. Um, so the violence can also be in the language, of course, or it can be in both things, but it's controlled violence. Mm. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to have read that right before reading Blizzard because for me, my entree is always prose. So getting a little of your your prose rendered perspective before experiencing the poetry, um, I think I benefited from. But but I enjoyed Blizzard and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping in the virtual book tour world, it, it has a nice, uh, a nice life. Thank you for making room for poetry in your program, Gil. Gil. I appreciate I it. I try. And I promise when we're able to do this for, for real, I will come up to Boston or we'll meet in New York or something and, and sit down in person for one of these. Okay. I'll look forward to that. I have to write another book. And that was Henri Cole. His brand new poetry collection is Blizzard from FSG. Came out, well, it came out today. If you're a time traveler, it is September 1st, 2020. You should pair Blizzard with Orphic Paris, his memoir of life in that city, which came out a couple of years ago from the New York Review of Books. Also, at a minimum, uh, you should pick up Pierce the Skin, which collects poems from his first six or seven collections up through 2007. I also really dug Nothing to Declare, which came out in 2015. I know I talked at the top of this one about how poetry kind of incites me to slow down, but I, I did kind of read a whole bunch of his stuff before we got together to record. So you should also check out Henri's site, henricole.com, for more on his, his poems, his life, and his virtual book tour for this one. He's also done some uh, collaborations with visual artists that are captured there. So that's H-E-N-R-I-C-O-L-E dot com. He's also on Twitter as Cole Henri. So spelled the same way, just the two words reversed. This will be in the show and episode notes for uh, for this one. Now. In the before time, this is when I would hit you guys up for support, tell you about my Patreon, PayPal, etc. 
Um, but we're not doing that this time. What we're doing is telling you to donate to other people, other causes, other foundations and nonprofits that are out there and in need. There are plenty of people and plenty of institutions that can use your help. So either go to individuals, Patreons, uh, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, or their tip jars or whatever. Go to the, um, the, the, the food banks, the freedom funds, uh, even political contributions. Um, there are people in need and there is a, a lot that needs fixing in this world. So if you're in a position to help and fix, then uh, please do. Uh, now, as far as poetry and um, my life goes, I do have a few dozen copies left of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers, which is not actually all poetry. There's about four or five poems in it. There's also essays, podcast excerpts, and other stuff. Um, it is free to uh, whoever wants it. You just got to drop me a line with your mailing address. It's not digital, only a print edition. Uh, visit haikuforbusinesstravelers.com, and there's a little information there and a form to fill out to get a copy. Otherwise, just email me. Um, you can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want through my PayPal, but this is not a money-making thing. This is, this is me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 